so good morning. Uh, like Glenn said, my name is Kayla Nimigan, and I'm an ICS major, and I'm graduating this semester. I am so ready to be done. Um, <laughs> no offense to Biola, I love y'all. But um, yeah, so most of you probably saw me walk up here, and we're like, but Kayla, you don't look disabled. Um, for any of you who did think that, and in a room this size, at least one of you did, can you come up and explain to me later how I can look more disabled, because I really struggle with that, um, and so I need some tips. But um, before we get hung up on it, I just want you all to let go of the notion that disability has a look or an age. It doesn't. Um, there is no mold for disability, as you're going to see from like the four of us today. We have vastly different disabilities, and just because I have a certain disability doesn't mean I represent everyone even with my disability. So just throw that out the window to start with and be open to the variety you're going to see today and the variety you're going to see out in the world beyond this. So, um, also, I realize for a lot of you, today is the first time that disability actually has a face. And I mean, like, more than a face that you see on TV, but, like, a face that you see out on the sidewalks or in the calf, in the dorm. This is disability. So, this is your moment to step into our stories with us, and I just ask that you be open to doing that. Um, I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which there's multiple ways of pronouncing it, so if you say it wrong, you haven't said it wrong, so you're good. Um, I'm going to call it EDS for the rest of the time because Ehlers-Danlos is a pain to say. Um, but basically, it's falling into the category, sometimes inconvenient category, of invisible disabilities. So for most of you who aren't pre-med science majors, you don't actually care, like, all the scientific jargon behind it. Um, if you are science or pre-med, you can join the people who are going to explain to me how to look more disabled and come talk to me after. But um, basically what it means is it's a genetic connective tissue disorder, so the protein in my body that's supposed to be acting like glue to like hold me all together doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Um, that comes with some cool benefits. I'm kind of like Elastigirl, my skin stretches. Um, it's also super soft, and I can scratch my own back, but <laughs> it also comes with like, a lot of downsides too. Um, I'm not going to go through all of those because there's a lot of them, but just to give you kind of an idea, I have chronic joint pain in all of my joints. Um, so just imagine like growing pains in your jaw and your fingers and your knees, like everything that is a joint has growing pains 24-7. Um, so that's kind of what it feels like. Um, I also get like fake heart attacks, so it's like the cartilage in my rib inflames and so it feels like I'm having a heart attack, like that sort of stabbing pain but I'm not, so I'm fine. If you see me in a class and I'm like holding my chest, you don't have to call the health center. I'm okay. Um, I also have chronic fatigue because my body is like working overtime to hold itself together. So that's kind of what that looks like. Um, the reason I call it sometimes inconvenient is because when people see me and assume that I'm not disabled, it gets kind of awkward because they see me at Disneyland in a wheelchair and it's like, oh, there's a 21-year-old healthy person who's decided to be lazy for the day. And then it's like, well, I'm not actually, but you can't see my pain. So in a sense, it's almost like when you've lost someone close to you or you're grieving over something and you're going about life as normally as possible and to everyone else, like, you look totally fine. Um, maybe to a few people who you've let in on that, they know you're not but you are constantly painfully aware that inside your body is falling apart. So that's kind of what it's like living with an invisible disability. Um, I'm gonna kind of shift gears a little and just talk to you about the fact that stories are valuable. Uh, we don't tend to think about the fact that you actually earn someone's story. When you engage in a relationship with someone, you are building trust over time, building rapport and earning pieces of their story and earning more depth to who they are. Um, and a lot of the time, the question that we get asked about disability from people who are able-bodied is like, okay, how do I approach someone who's disabled or how do I like ask politically correctly about their disability? And I want to say to you, like, you need to engage with the human before you engage with their disability. Because if you just approach me and ask me questions about EDS, I'll tell you the answers, but you're not going to get the depth and the like personal experience behind it that you would if you are somebody I've been in a relationship with for years and I'm comfortable saying, you know what, like, I'm broken, okay, like, here's where I'm at, this is how much I'm really struggling with this. So 
please take the time to see a person first, realize that like we watch Netflix just like you do. Um, you can ask us what we like to watch. That's okay too, you don't have to just ask about my braces. Um, we're more than our disability and we're more than the accessibility devices that we use. So please try to avoid having that be the first thing you talk to us about. Um, I also just wanted to say that one of the things that I've seen within the church is this idea that you owe someone your story, especially if you've dealt with suffering. Um, that basically the reason that God puts suffering in the world is for good testimonies. And that's not why. Um, even if Max hadn't forced me to join this group today and speak about the suffering, my suffering would have a purpose in that God has used it to soften my heart from screaming, why God, what the heck is wrong, where are you, to I need thee, oh I need thee, every hour, I need thee. And even if that was the only thing that came out of my disability and my suffering, that's a good enough reason for me to have EDS. So I just want you to, be encouraged in the fact that if you're struggling, God can bring good out of that in any way, not just you getting up in front of hundreds of people and having to bury your soul with all its gory details. So in closing, I just wanted to share this verse with you. Um, and he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So, my name is Max So. I'm a junior sociology major here at Biola. Yep, and uh, I, so today I'm just gonna share with you a bit about, more about my disability and how I've come to view it, how I think some of the good ways to help those who are going through disabilities and so on and so forth. So, um, basically, I was born with this eye condition known as retinitis pigmentosa, and it's uh, RP for short. Um, and what happens is it, um, it's a condition that leads to pigmentation in the retina, leading to vision loss. So, you know, people have central vision and peripheral vision, so most of my central is almost all gone, basically. And uh, I have some peripheral um, on this side, but I can't see detail with it, so I can't read and write. Reading and writing is uh, almost... Uh, uh, next to impossible for me, basically. And um, so, uh, how I do all my work and stuff is thankfully for technology, I have a software on my computer that reads everything to me, but even then, um, there's some struggles there which I'll share later. Um, I, uh, when it comes to navigating and stuff like that, so if a person walks past me, I can see that a person walked past me, but if the person didn't say who he or she is, there's no way I can tell who the person is. Um, and when it comes to walking around, it's particularly hard for me in, uh, unfamiliar places. So when I first came to Biola, I remember I had to work with two mobility specialists. Uh, I had to come two weeks early, work with these two mobility specialists for six days, about three hours each day. So that's like 18 hours just walking up and down campus, um, making sure I'm familiarized with all the main places. And even now there's some places I'm not too sure where they are. But anyway, that's a main general overview of my visual impairment. And usually when I share about my visual impairment, the common question I get is, you know, Max, how can people help those who are visually impaired or who to help those who are, um, have disabilities? And I can tell you that right now there's no one size fit all answer. And it's, but there, I do believe that there are some abstract concepts we can lay on the table to, um, that will apply to most if not all disabilities. And number one, we have to realize that, you know, people with disabilities go through a lot of inequity and inequalities every single day. Um, but however, we have to realize that inequality and inequity, it is a systemic issue that is driven by individuals who are oblivious. And this is what I mean by this. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm gonna use this phrase called non-disabled privilege. And for the sake of time, this def definition is gonna be simple. Um, basically, if you don't have a physical or mental disability, you have non-disabled privilege. And so, um, and here's the, here's the thing about privilege I've come to learn is that privilege is often invisible to those who have it. So I, I was telling you about my software. Um, there's some things that, even though it helps me out with homework, there's some things I still find it hard to do. Uh, for example, basically, if there's anything hard copy and print, uh, I need to first convert it to soft copy before I can do anything with the document and um, so that my reader can read it out to me. But also, depending on how the, the textbook was uh, designed, so let's say if a textbook um, 
uh, designer designed the textbook with a lot of colors and pictures. Well, guess what? Screen reading technology doesn't do well with colors and pictures. And oftentimes, it takes me like far longer to get those assignments done if, it, if that book is used with colors and pictures. But here's the thing. Um, when the person, whoever designs textbooks, when they're designing a book with colors and pictures, what are they doing? Are they thinking like, how can I discriminate against those who can't see? They're, they're not thinking that. What they are doing is though they are focusing on the main majority dominant group, which in this case is the dis non-disabled person, um, and targeting their needs, uh, the average reader, so to speak. What happens there is the minorities, which in this case is the disabled person, has to face inequality and inequity. And um, so that's how, in my opinion, inequity and inequality works. Uh, it thrives on obliviousness and indifference, in my opinion. But lest you think that I'm trying to point the finger at anyone, at any, um, at any person, at any group, I want to tell you right now, I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not pointing the finger at anyone. In fact, right now, I'm going to use myself, point the finger at myself, uh, how I've, come, I've been oblivious to some of my privileges that I've had. So recently, I met up with two deaf students here on Biola campus. Um, and it was an awesome conversation as I, we exchanged stories. But here's the thing um, that's really stood out to me. Although a deaf student uh, and myself technically grew up with a disability, there's a lot of things that a deaf student has to go through on a daily basis that I don't even have to think about. And uh, you know, how many times do I go to chapel and worry whether or not um, the speaker will be facing straight at the audience so I can read his or her lips? I never think about that. Uh, how often do I go to a function or event worry or not whether there's going to be someone there doing sign language? Um, I never to worry about that, and I never to think about that. And because I don't think about that, I don't do anything about it. And because I don't do anything about it, those who actually suffer from it are left to fight for themselves. So, in my opinion, you, could, you, you might be thinking, OK, I get that, and how, how should we proceed? And I'm actually going to uh, conclude quite similarly with what Kayla did and knowing the importance of individual stories. Um, I remember the Sunday right after I met these two deaf students, I, um, I was in church and uh, I was listening to the pastor speak and um, uh, I was, uh, you know, I was, the first thing I thought was like, how, how are the deaf people supposed to take this information in? And then I turned to my friend, I was like, hey, is there someone out there doing ASL for deaf people? And I, he's like, no, there isn't. And he's like, I was like, okay, do you know what services our church is doing to help those who are hearing impaired? And he's like, um, no, that's a good question. I, I actually don't know. And I was thinking to myself, huh, imagine if like a non-Christian visitor to the church I go to who's deaf uh, goes to a church and realizes there's no, there's no ASL services really available. What kind of message and witness are we sending this person? Um, and so I went to contact the elder and stuff like that. And here's the thing. The reason why I bring this story up is because I wouldn't even be having those thoughts if I did not step into the story of a deaf person and get to know that person's story. And that's, so, that's why individual stories are so important. And you know, often at times I talk to people and people ask me, Max, can you give me some practical tips that I can use to start conversations with people with disabilities? I cannot do that. I uh, cannot speak for every single person with a visual impairment, let alone everyone with a disability. It's just, I just cannot do that. It's, we just have too many diff diverse, too diverse uh, body of stories um, for me to do that. And you know, some people are, are I've come across other non-disabled friends of mine, they're like, I, I want to, I want to say this, but I'm afraid like people might take this as an offense, and um, so that's why I say individual stories are so important because if uh, we don't, um, different people are going to react to different comments in different ways. Uh, I'm I tend to you know I'm not I'm, I'm kind of a thick skin kind of person. I don't really um, not there's quite a few things that offend me really. However, if you say the same thing to someone else with a not a disability in another situation, could have a complete different reaction. And there's some things I find a little bit offensive that if you tell it to another person another disability, he or she may not find offensive at all. So that's why it says, it, it, you know, but here's the thing, if we, in order to know who goes where, who's who, who, what kind of person will react to what kind of comment and what kind of situation, um, we have to know ultimately the person. Uh, and like Kayla was saying, the importance of in individuals' um, stories, it, in my opinion, it, it comes from adopting a lifestyle of stepping into individual stories. That way we can broaden our perspective and that way we can start not being oblivious to, to the needs of others and start actually doing something. Again, not blaming anyone if anything, you know, we're all well to, uh, we're all to um, have, have a part to play in this. And um, just to close, to wrap things up, I would, you know, with, uh, I just want to 
when, whenever these kind of chapels happen, I feel like it's one thought that comes up is, you know, uh, well, it's not my fault, you know, I, I, I didn't intend, you know, I didn't know about that, that this would cause this kind of inequality in society. But here's the thing, we have to stop asking ourselves, and myself included, um, we have to stop asking ourselves whose fault is it. When it comes to struggles and when we let's hear about inequality, we have to stop asking ourselves whose fault is it and start asking ourselves whose responsibility is it to do something, to whose responsibility is it to create an equitable, uh, shalomic environment in our community. And if we ask ourselves that question, the answer is everyone. Uh, you, me, everyone, especially if you consider yourself a follower of Christ. So um, that's, uh, that's basically my, some of my thoughts and all I have to say to you guys today. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Have a good day and God bless you. So I graduated in 95. I, was, I had the privilege of being an art major. Um, I'm biased, I'm sorry. Yeah. And um, so here I am, and I want to share a little bit about my story. Um, I, as you can see, I'm in a wheelchair, in case you haven't noticed. Um, and I have a, how many of you guys have seen the movie The Theory of Everything? Two people, wow, okay. All right, so how many of you guys have heard of Stephen Hawking? Thank you, okay, good. <laughs> Just gonna get worried. Um, so Stephen Hawking has a disease called ALS. I don't have that, but I have something kind of similar to neuromuscular disease called charcot marie tooth. And although it's not to the same degree, it's not life-threatening, but um, that's probably a little bit of what my story is like. Um, I have a degenerative, so my condition is progressive. So my struggle has not necessarily, well, it has been in the sense of like being in a wheelchair and being, um, dealing with like barriers and access and things like that. But for me, it's been a little different. Because of the nature of um, my condition and its progression, um, I would say that I stopped walking when I was nine nine years of age, and then, you know, it's, it's just been changing. And thankfully, it hasn't changed all that much in the recent years, but part of my journey has been what to do with loss. And so, if you guys have not seen the movie, I would strongly encourage you to just see the movie. And part of, you know, I just saw the movie two weeks ago, and when I was looking at it, I, I was really touched, and um, it really, you know, kind of like, struck a nerve in some ways because I realized, wow, this human, you know, this is a story of someone that has to go through the journey of loss. And so for me, you know, that's pretty much the struggle and my, my journey with the Lord even. So what I want to talk to you a little bit about is part of the struggle with that. I was born with, with my disability. So part of the struggle with that is what to do with identity. And I know that that's not just my own struggle. I know that for all of us at one point in our life, we, we come to that question, who am I? And especially when things are not going the way that we think they should be, or life is not the way it should be, or we go through struggles, the bigger question is, um, who is God? And the bigger question is, uh, how can God be good? So part of my experience has been struggling with that. And even though I was at Biola, and in fact right now I'm studying at Fuller, I'm um, getting a master's in theology similar to an MDiv. But even part of that, there was so much comfort to study the scripture, especially study Job, and realize that it is fine. It is okay to ask. It is okay to be in that place of um, wrestling with God. It is okay to be in that place where, you know, even raise my fist and say, this is unfair. And I find that God in his great mercy and in his infinite love allows us to be in that place of um, brokenness. And part of being or having a disability is knowing that I embody that. You know, all of you guys struggle with something. And all of you, all of us, it's a, it's a common human thread that we are broken human beings. 
And for people with disabilities, they embody that. So when we look at someone with a disability, you know, they are the embodiment, we are the embodiment of brokenness. And part of the struggle with that is that you deal with identity because there is a social stigma attached to it. You know, being disabled is not something that people really want in their life. I have yet to meet someone that says, yes, I want to be in a wheelchair. And that's just a reality. It is something that we run away from. It is something that we um, are afraid of. And there's a lot of fear attached to that. So living with that, knowing that, growing up with that, um, and then, you know, coming to face with God is good. And I, I'm here to say, yes, I'm still a believer. Yes, I am, you know, God is, continually show me that he is good, that he holds me in my weakness, that my identity is based on something other than my physical experience. And in fact, I actually want to share something with you, some scripture. Um, I want you guys to go with me to 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 13. Verse 7 through 10. Okay, so I'm going to read. It says, but we, have, but we have this treasure in jars of clays to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Verse 8. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. Verse 10 has, has got to be, it's, it's one of the most comforting scriptures for my own personal life. Verse 10, it says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our bodies. And so when I think about my physical body, my body that on some days, uh, physically hurts, or on some days it is weaker than the rest, or on days where I, I can feel the physical weakness coming on. And it, it, it does something to your heart. It does something to your spirit and to your emotions. And I realize and I understand what Paul is saying, that the death of Christ, even though might be in my body, but his life is what keeps me going. His supernatural power is what continually gives me the strength to continue. And it is something supernatural in my own experience. And so I would like to share that with you, that let that be, um, you know, we all can live in the crucifixion of Jesus and in the resurrection of Jesus, regardless of what your struggle with is, the life of Christ will shine through that experience. Thank you. Good morning, students and faculty. My name is Kelly Yang, and I am a graduating senior majoring in the field of psychology. Woo! All right. Yep. So before I begin, I just want to recognize my audience's possible pain and guilt when it comes to topics such as racial reconciliation, identity, and disabilities. I have come to realize that it must be difficult to receive and, or to even feel blamed. I want to say that you are not the ones who are responsible for the cause of my disability or even the hardships that come. Today, I simply want to share my journey with each of you, together as one body in Christ. I will talk about what disability I have and its complexities, how you can be part of my adventure, and how God sees both you and me. I was born with cerebral palsy, which is a complex disorder that affects my motor skills and muscle coordination. I was a premature infant, making my entry into the world 
weighing under a pound. I was unable to stay in the womb for 10 more weeks. My body wasn't able to do its final fine tuning. Doctors prepared my parents for the worst, saying I was only gonna live a few days and suffer complications in my eyes, lung, and heart. To my family's surprise, I lived and received zero complications. Long story short, surgery was my best friend, leg braces were my accessories and bling, and cerebral palsy was the shadow that followed me everywhere I went. I actually did not know I was different from other children until I entered kindergarten at a private Christian school from back home, the island of Guam. Kids picked on me, called me names, and even imitated the way I walked. I had no explanation whatsoever when kids asked me why I could not function like them. I just wanted to be me, to be a person who wanted to be part of the team. The back and forth confusion of my identity grew exponentially from kindergarten all the way to high school. The world told me I was nothing, amounting to no success, talent, or respect. So let's imagine this together. I believe a good handful of people here have experienced a sprained ankle in their lifetime or anything that basically forced a different way of doing daily routines. So maybe you land funny or you're injured playing sports. The ankle has you now focused on your body more than usual and tasks that were once a breeze became arduous and slow. Somebody may carry your books, grab you a few plates of food at the calf, and even bring over a chair during class to elevate your foot. That is the normal until your ankle is healed. Although it is silly to compare, my life is similar to that kind of reality every day. I must plan out everything I do, how to get from point A to point B, how long it takes me, where the place is located, and account for how many barriers I need to go through to reach my final destination. Sometimes, I don't know if any of you, have, how many of you guys have watched Fast and the Furious series, any of you? All right, cool. So sometimes, I wish there was a nitrous oxide system on my scooter, or maybe a jetpack strapped on, so that I won't be late to class on days where I'm behind schedule. I admit, the craziness of my life and living in general easily distract me from remembering who I truly am in Christ. I concentrate too much on the external things, such as how people think of me, the daily struggles of cerebral palsy, and the appearance that screams out inadequacy. That more than the things above. It can be scary at times to befriend those who have disabilities. So today, I have prepared some helpful tips for you. Number one, change your question or statement. Questions that you use on a regular basis can sometimes have loaded language that can be hard for somebody with a disability to hear. For example, can I help you? Implies that someone needs help or is visibly struggling. If I come across a clear barrier, such as a door without an automatic button, that is a definite struggle. But if I'm just going about my regular routine, can I help you? Communicates, I'm incapable. When in doubt, ask, do you, think, do you need anything instead? While it may not seem like a big difference, this change in wording is 
this change in wording gives me space to say, no, I do not need anything. Even asking what a person finds handy will let you know what specifically I or the other person expects of you. Get to know the person first before the disability. It is not inviting when people ask about vulnerable areas of disability and then walk away. Ask how my day was, what I like and dislike, what are my favorite hobbies on my spare time. And lastly, be ready to listen and to learn. We may believe we are not good enough or have what it takes to love others as Christ loved us, but we definitely can through the gospel. Since Christ displayed the ultimate demonstration of love by laying his life for us, so then we are compelled to love others. I want to end by sharing two passages with you as encouragements. The first one is Exodus 4, 10 through 12. But Moses said to the Lord, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow in speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. Second Corinthians 2, five through 20. I mean, five, chapter five, verse 20. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Biola, God is a God who can make the seemingly impossible possible. It is through Christ that I am able to love others and be reconciled. You know what? I feel just like Moses, man. It's like not feeling capable of doing anything for the kingdom of God, going through all this, you know, struggle and turmoil, giving excuses to God as to why he has chosen, and you've chosen an incompetent person, man. You got the wrong, you got the wrong girl here. I, I, can't, I can't do it. You somebody else who's better. However, God does not call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. So my final question to y'all as we end today, would you be willing to join my adventure? Thank you so much for coming. I can close us in prayer really quick and you are dismissed thereafter. Let's pray. Father God, uh, just thank you so much for this time together to learn, to grow, and to see one another as you have seen us. We praise you and thank you for who you are. Thank you so much for dying for each and every one of us, Lord. And I pray that as we go on for spring break and other leisurely activities, Lord, that we would um, Keep others in mind in this race. That is not just us individually finishing off well, but it is in unity uh, together as one body in your name. And so I pray that you would keep each individual here safe over spring break. And I pray that you bring us safely back and motivated to finish out the remainder of the semester. And so I pray you bless this time and bless our break, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.